Hey everyone, welcome to the E4 Bioscience webcast about the future of cannabis testing. I'm your host, Sean Opie. I'm the managing partner of E4 Bioscience, and we are a strategic consulting firm that helps investors and lab teams fund, design, build, equip, license, staff, operate, and accredit cannabis laboratories. The objectives of the presentation today are threefold. First, I'd like to review the current and future business climate for compliance testing. We'll look at some of the pain points with a specific emphasis on the regulatory climate. And then I think it's interesting to take a look at one value add test that is not part of compliance testing. And I'm specifically going to look at DNA sequencing for chemovar patenting. Okay, let's move forward and take a peek at the business climate. So the uh, U.S. cannabis testing market growth is uh, certainly on an upwards curve. Um, as you can see in the data that has been um, released by Grandview as well as GMI, you can see that they're estimating a significant, um, like a, a significant increase in the compounded annual growth rate of about somewhere between 13 and 15 percent through 2027. Now. Obviously, compliance testing is the smallest component of the cannabis market, but because it's involved in safety and uh, quality, it's an essential component. So today the market size is about a billion. It's expected to go to two, maybe three billion over the next few years. And the composition of the market primarily, uh, or who the, who, the labs are, who the labs are finding for business are primarily your cultivators. They're looking for the full compliance testing for flower and also environmental testing for mold. The secondary segment are your processors and manufacturers. They're going to require compliance testing for all of their products, concentrates, beverages, edibles, etc. Um, there's a smaller market for hemp farmers, but uh, the problem is that it's seasonal. It's primarily a potency test and maybe looking at some additional cannabinoids. Uh, and then I think as the future moves forward, we'll begin to see some pharmaceutical companies getting interested in this for lot release testing and for stability testing. The problem, of course, is that there is no public data available to estimate segment percentages do, or, 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 or get an estimate of the, uh, the true market size. But I think it is fair to say that cannabis testing is here to stay. Okay, so the current compliance tests then, or the current cannabis laboratory test, I break into three different categories. There's compliance testing. These are all the ones that we know and are very familiar with. There's some R&D testing, which overlaps with compliance. So this doesn't go into statewide monitoring systems, but often people like to get an idea of what the turf bean profile looks like or their cannabinoid concentrations are like as, um, as plants are growing. And then there's these value add tests, which are not compliance tests. They're not required, but it's my belief that they can add value to both the cultivator, processor, as you know, generate revenue for the lab. And so this includes terpene profiling, doing a nutrient analysis, looking at soil pathogens, trying to identify chemovars, looking at the environment within the greenhouse, um, stability testing, and then there's some weird stuff with personalized medicine uh, and also some drug and product stability. But, um, you know, today we only have time to look at one, and so we'll be looking at chemovar, chemovar things. Um, okay, so the business challenges and opportunities then. Obviously, the price of entry for setting up a testing laboratory is expensive. Um, it's just hard to get into the business unless you have some cash. We know that as we move forward, because of the number of laboratories coming online, there's gonna be increased competition for samples and certainly for technical staff. So hiring is gonna become more and more difficult. Um, as there are more laboratories, we're going to see a real pressure on turnaround time. People are going to expect that to be within 72 hours. And uh, if there are options, price is going to be pushed down. Because of labor and downwards pressure on pricing, we should expect to see automation and kind of the introduction of robotics into laboratories. And so as a reminder in the top right, I have a picture of a, of a, uh, of a Hamilton MicroStar, and this is an automated liquid handler that essentially performs many of the functions of a laboratory scientist. It doesn't think, 
but it does. Um, as margins and samples become, uh, become harder to come by, I think this is where we're going to find labs looking for complementary testing revenue streams. And that's one I'll talk about a little later. Um, we'll see some merger and acquisition activity as that is going to support the emergence of true multi-state operators or national operators. And then I expect the federal government to pop in someday and um, hopefully not wipe out what the states have done a pretty good job setting up, but really be supportive of this. And then finally, and this is a real challenge, I expect lawsuits to begin over contested testing results. Um, there's a lot of money at stake here, and if labs make errors, people are going to sue. Okay, that's the business climate. Let's take a look at the regulatory climate. Um, so the first question I like to ask is, why, why do we test in the first place? And the short answer is, it's the law. Um, I spend a lot of time in Michigan thinking about Michigan, so I'm going to use them as an example for this presentation. And the, um, the uh, marijuana regulatory agency is responsible for enforcing the laws that have been put forth. And in particular, um, highlighted down in the bottom right, uh, it's covered by my, um, by my video, but you can see that before a product, a marijuana product can leave the growing facility, it must be tested by a licensed safety compliance facility. And the same thing is true before it can be sold or, or transferred to a, uh, to, to a retail spot, uh, shop. So again, it's the law. That's why we test. Now, okay, I always like to ask, well, why are, why are these laws out there? And specifically, what do the regulators at the state and national level want? Well, I think there are three primary goals here. First and foremost, we want safety and to minimize potential health hazards. A good example of that takes us back to the 1800s when snake oil was out there and, um, you know, <laughs> many of these had ingredients in them that were, were frankly dangerous. And if you ingested them, you would get sick. So really, I think the most important thing for testing is safety. Um, secondary, secondarily is quality and effectiveness. And people, consumers want accurate label and, and regulators in particular don't want any false claims about what a product can do. And then finally, uh, uh, honesty. Um, the regulators want people to follow the rules that promote safety and quality. Um, because if you're dishonest and you have low quality, I, I think you get the stamp of a used car salesman and that's not what this industry wants right now. As an industry, we should be looking for credibility and integrity. So let's take a look at three examples then as they relate to safety, quality, and honesty. So I know that e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury or e-valley has been discussed ad nauseum, but I do think it's important to remember that you know a year and a half ago, there were 2,700 hospitalizations and 70 deaths related to a contaminant in, um, in primarily THC containing cartridges. And the contaminant was vitamin E acetate. I think what's really interesting about this one, and maybe we'll talk about this a little further in the presentation, is that this was not a required test. Testing was initiated after the health problem was identified. So it wasn't the standard cadre of contaminants that states have been requiring testing companies to look for. Again, it was discovered after there was a health hazard. Um, so a quality example, we're gonna run through this one kind of quickly, um, but I think it's important that, um, that labeling is fair. And unfortunately, let me see if I can move this for you guys here. Um, let's do that. Um, from a, from a labeling perspective, we've got a product here that com contains 65% CBD. I did a fairly quick search to go find, I, I just used the QR code to go find the testing report. And the testing report suggests about 50% CBD or 55% CBD. So you know, clearly this is a discrepancy between what's true and, and what's on the label. Um, 
I can say I can say the same thing. Unfortunately, for THC two, this product contain claims that it has no THC in it, but actually it has about 0.3, maybe a little more than 0.3 percent. So if this were a hemp product, if this were considered a hemp product, it would actually be classified as marijuana because it's above the federal um, limit for THC in a cannabis plant to be considered hemp. So, you know, this product, in, in my opinion, is just mislabeled. Um, I don't want to say falsely labeled, but it's certainly mislabeled. Okay, let me move this back down and we'll go to the next slide and take a look at honesty. Um, actually, we'll move this back up so we can read everything. So the Mar Marijuana Regulatory Agency just recently had a product recall and um, it was released in July 7th, 2021. So it, and I'm not going to go into the details, but what they what they they're recalling this because of unapproved testing and sampling methods on approximately 10,000 edibles, 10,000 edibles. Um, you know. There's a real labor cost here because the retailers are going to have to go through all of the recall activities, um, and 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 this 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 affected 42 dispensaries who received this product. So imagine the amount of time that is going into this. Um, it's just a huge labor cost. Secondly, there's reputational damage for the processor and um, possibly for the laboratory. There's not quite enough information in the current or currently available to understand understand the root cause of this issue, but I think there's going to be some reputational damages. Um, from a big picture perspective, this really, I, I think, negatively affects the credibility and integrity of the cannabis industry as a whole. When 10,000 products are being recalled because unapproved testing was performed and uh, it, it seems like samples may have been hid in a back room. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to get buy-in from the wider audience when these kind of shenanigans are occurring. So there are three examples about safety, quality, and honesty. Let me um, get back here. Um, and I like to focus on quality. It's a, it's, a, it's a favorite of mine because I think from quality stems many, many, many other things, in, including safety and honesty. So let's talk about what the, what the foundations of quality are. Um, in the laboratory world, it's, it's um, having a, a, a documented and used quality management system. And this is a presentation all by itself, but what we're looking at are resources, the responsibility of the management team or the executive team, um, what kind of corrective and preventative actions are being taken, design control, product surveillance, and finally some of your processes and controls. Excuse me. What we are going to look at today from, again, it's a big, big topic. We're going to look at competency of, um, of the laboratory and, and how that relates to proficiency testing. So two smaller subcategories in an overall quality management system. Okay, so from an analytical laboratory perspective, most states are deferring to the international standard uh, 17025, the 17,025 standard, that talks about the general requirements for the competence and testing of calibration laboratories. Um, I've just picked a couple um, sections out of here, in particular the scope and section 77.2, where they, talk about specifying the competence of the laboratory and, and other things as well. But one of the requirements requirements in order to be accredited to the standard is participation in proficiency testing. So let's ask the question, what's a proficiency test? Um, and in brief, it's an inter-laboratory peer program that compares one laboratory results against some unknown specimens to results from another laboratory using the same or very similar methods. So usually there's a, a pilot laboratory or a pilot organization that provides all of the samples and distributes all these unknown specimens to the labs. And then each of these laboratories get a chance to test these and provide the results back. And then that pilot lab provides a summary of all of those results. 
So let's take a look at that in action. Um, Emerald Scientific is well known in this industry for providing um, or providing being an early provider of proficiency testing, although there are others that will soon be coming online. And one of the questions that we like to ask is, how do you know that a lab is competent? So um, again, with permission from uh, Emerald Scientific, I am providing some a summary of their statistical data uh, for specifically total THC, uh, a total THC sample. And I think in this red box over here, you can see the count of the number of labs whose results were not acceptable, i.e. they were outside of the bell curve that all of the other labs were within. So while most of the laboratories, um, uh, 11 out of 14, have acceptable results for Delta 9 THC, three of them do not. And this is where Emerald Scientific will choose to award a proficiency test badge or not. And so understanding the, the, the results from proficiency testing is a really good way to understand if a lab is at least competent. Um, now, I have a couple bones to pick with this one because this is being done in, uh, the, the sample was provided in a CEDUNET trial. Um, this is predominantly, excuse me, because it's difficult to mail, it's illegal to mail uh, marijuana across state lines. So this is one way they do it. The problem with that is that by having THC dissolved in acetonite trial, you're missing a very important laboratory step. Now, I want to get to that laboratory step by taking a look at first how errors or variants, if you will, in, in an analytical laboratory occur. So this is an outstanding publication from 2012 by Ellison and, uh, and et al. And what they did is they serve, um, they, look, they looked at proficiency, excuse me, they looked at corrective and preventative action plans from 40 or so laboratories to understand where laboratories were diagnosing their own errors and as you can see, by far the most common place to find an error was in sample preparation. And so the problem then with this specific proficiency test is because the, because the, the analyte of interest, THC, has already been extracted from a plant, you are skipping the sample or the bulk of the sample preparation step. Um, so until we figure out how to do proficiency tests that have um, that, re, that that begin with the cannabis flower matrix, um, uh, we have to be aware that sample preparation errors are a real cause of variance in, part, in proficiency testing. Okay. Um, the other thing about proficiency testing is that all of the laboratories have, in effect, proprietary sample preparations. Um, the, said differently, these are all laboratory developed tests. They're specific for the instruments and the, the actual laboratory that they're performed in. And some of the differences in these procedures are going to be time, temperature, the kinds of ingredients or reagents that are used, the quality of those reagents, the analytical technique of the staff, as well as the equipment being used. So, you know, here's a list of the laboratory or some of the laboratories that are located in the state of Michigan. And again, they're all going to have different sample preparation methods. So one of the things that we're going, um, uh, one of the things that we have to consider is, uh, or one of the purpose of these proficiency tests are to demonstrate that even though these methods are slightly different, they're going to return equivalent results for a sample, um, for for a sample with the same characteristics sent to each of these labs. Okay, so getting back to what I was saying earlier, um, Emerald Scientific has recognized this as well as many labs, and they are going and they are beginning to provide samples that have a matrix background. So essentially, spiked samples or samples that have been well characterized. They're going to provide flour or concentrate or chocolate. And I think this is going to be a big push moving forwards. Um, 
So, okay, there's a lot of different cannabis matrices to consider. It's not just flowers anymore. You know, pre-rolls have paper associated with them, and because that's part of the uh, that that's going to be part of the inhalant, um, you know, we have to test that as well. Do laboratories need to process a pre-roll slightly differently than a plant or flower? And the same question can be asked for all of these. Um, let's take an example: chocolate and beverages. Chocolate is a solid. It's very, very fatty, um, and um, whereas beverages have no fat, they have a lower pH, and they, they have a lot of sugar in them traditionally. Um, can you use the same extraction methodology to prepare these samples for testing? I think the industry is saying no, and ultimately, and so are the, so are the uh, analytical scientists because they're seeing it in the lab, and. What is going to happen is that all of these or many of these different matrices are going to have individual proficiency tests specific to them. Um, and that th th those proficiency tests or matrix specific proficiency tests are being organized by a variety of different organizations, um, either national, international, um, I'm listing them down here. I'm not going to name them, um, but it's my belief that the AOAC International and specifically the Cannabis Analytical Science Program is going to be a leader in providing cannabis specific proficiency tests. So, you know, for everybody out there, keep your eyes on AOAC International because they are really providing a number of the testing standards and are developing what is going to be a very high quality proficiency testing program. Okay, so what should we expect in the future? Now, remember, we're looking into a crystal ball here, which is a very dangerous thing to do because, um, you know, crystal balls have a, have a tendency to be wrong, but it's my belief that we are going to have many more and also matrix specific proficiency testing with much lower acceptable variance. Um, in the Emerald Scientific results that I showed you, the acceptable variance was 20%. Um, I think we're going to see that narrowed considerably. I think we're going to see uniform standards for medical marijuana and also adult use marijuana. So we're going to see very consistent sampling requirements, sample preparation requirements, testing and also action limits, although the action limits will likely be different for medical and adult use. And then finally, getting back to the Evali example, I think we're going to see exploratory contaminant testing probably at the state or federal level where random samples are going to be uh, tested, um, not so much for, what, for known contaminants, but for unknown contaminants that we want to watch or th th that the regulators want to watch for and different kind of technology but um, expect random exploratory contaminant testing okay getting back to ISO 17025 accreditation I do want to note that while it is a great foundation for laboratory quality um, that it, there are things that it does not imply um, it certainly doesn't imply that a laboratory has ethical behavior and I also like to point out that it doesn't expect laboratories to be 100% perfect or accurate and 100% consistent and provide reproducible data. Um, what it does allow for though is for labs to recognize that they're not perfect or consistent and mitigate that to the best of their abilities. So what I like to tell the cultivators is you know give labs a little bit of a break you can't expect them to be perfect it's really hard to be perfect. Um, but then my advice or my pro tip for the cultivators is ask to see the most recent accreditation report or even older ones if you can to understand where the lab really may be struggling. Um, you know, you can get your badges and you can get your certifications, but most of the time laboratories do have some deficiencies and I think you should ask about them. Um, understand what they're doing to, to address those deficiencies. So ask for their reports. Okay, 
Let's move into value add testing. And the example that I wanted to take a look at was DNA sequencing here. Um, now, before I uh, before we get into that, oh, my video is not rotating. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, I've got a, a, a blue dream and a nine pound hammer bud here. They're both supposed to be rotating for you. And um, I've got a question for you. Are they different? You know, I'm not a cultivator, but they look pretty similar to me. But they are absolutely marketed differently. So before we can get into answering the question of whether the same or they're different, what we need to do is provide just a short three slide background about genetics and, and, and biology. So plant leaves are created or plant, plant leaves are formed by an aggregation of individual cells down at the bottom of, of this image here. These cells have a nucleus which contains all of the genetic material which is, um, is essentially found in multiple chromosomes. These chromosomes, they've got some structural, um, some interesting structural features about them that I don't think are important for this presentation. But ultimately what we do get to is the double helix structure of DNA that we're all probably pretty, uh, pretty aware of right now. And I'd like to point out that DNA is kind of like a ladder that's been twisted and the rungs on the ladder are chemical compounds, um, you know, adenine, thymidine, guanosine, uh, cytosine, but A, T and, and G's and C's, and they pair up. And the sequence and order of these um, really dictates a lot of important characteristics about the plant and in fact, any living organism. So. I'm going to talk about two things, phenotype and genotype. The phenotype is um, an actual property of an individual or of a plant that results from the genetic sequence or the genotype. And in the case of cannabis, that's going to be inflorescence color, um, cannabinoid content, um, what the specific terpene profile is, many of the physical characteristics about the plant. Um, many of these you can see, some of them you have to test for, but again, these are the result of what the genetics are. The genotype then is the hereditary information that is contained in the sequence of DNA and usually refers to a very specific gene. And again, it's the order and the mix of the A's and G's and C's and T's. So visually then, um, phenotype is something you can see, like some really cool looking fruity petal buds here. And the genotype is what is inside the DNA or, or the, 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 the order of the A's and G's and C's and T's in the DNA. Okay, let's take a quick think then about cannabis phenotyping. So remember some of the, um, some of the physical characteristics of the plant. Well. Again, I want to talk about Blue Dream and Nine Pound Hammer. Um, from an appearance perspective, they look pretty darn similar to me. Um, from a terpene profile perspective, they have they express this, many of the same terpenes at the same level. So the primary ones being pinene, uh, mercy and caryophyllene. And you can see that the, um, the amount, which is, which is determined by how far towards the edge of the circle go, you know, these look very, very similar. So from a terpene perspective, they kind of they smell and taste the same. And then from a cannabinoid profiling perspective, looking at the THC and CBD ratios, one is, you know, on average, 18% THC, 1% CBD, whereas nine pound hammers, uh, about 19% THC and 1% CBD within standard air, in, in my opinion. Well, <laughs> I look at these and say they're the same. I do not see a difference between these except for name. Okay, maybe we can address that by using some molecular technology and specific next generation sequencing, and sometimes I'll call that NGS for short. Um, here's an overview of the process for NGS sequencing. Um, in a sense, it's very similar to analytical chemistry, but first samples are extracted 
uh, or DNA is extracted from the cannabis flower. Um, you know, this is one of many instruments that can be used to extract DNA. Then it goes on to, uh, to, 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 to create a, a library of that DNA, um, you know, library prep, which is very similar, very different methodology, but very similar conceptually to sample prep in, um, in analytical chemistry testing. Once the samples are ready, these are then loaded onto some DNA sequencers. I've just provided a couple examples of these, and a lot of magic happens in there, which again, a different presentation, we're not going to talk about it. There's a tremendous amount of data that comes out of that, about a terabyte worth of information per sample. And that has to go through a bioinformatics processing pathway to extract the key information. And then we can begin to look at some of the differences in DNA sequences between, um, between a couple plants if you wanna compare them. And ultimately what you'll do is go through something called variant curation uh, to understand what those specific differences are. Now, I'm going to give you a very simplified example of that variant curation here. Um, and by looking at you know, how we genotype a couple different plants here. So again, purely hypothetical, we've got Blue Dream and Nine Pound Hammer. Again, from a phenotype perspective, they look pretty much the same, but it is entirely possible that in one of their genes, there is going to be a difference at some portion in the, G, in the DNA sequence where instead of being a T and an A, there is a G and a C. Or vice versa, in nine pound hammer, there might be a G and a C, and in uh, Blue Dream, there might be a T and an A. These kinds of changes are very, uh, very um, identifiable, and they, they can very easily distinguish from a genetic perspective between Blue Dream and Nine Pound Hammer. And that can be used to do something important. In particular, a company can start to apply for patents so they can have some form of intellectual property. Now, I've downloaded a, um, a US patent application uh, from Medicinal Genomics where they have a patent on a specific THCA and CBD uh, A gene. And this was um, awarded in February of 2014. So it's now, you know, a good eight, eight years old. Um, and the question is, why did they do this? Did it provide any value? And what I am going to suggest is it absolutely provided value to medicinal genomics because in 2014, when the patent was awarded, they had raised about $20 million worth of money. And I am going to predict, although it's, it's, we don't know the true history here, that the patents, it takes four to seven years to, uh, pat patenting takes time um, to, to run its way through the system. But it wouldn't surprise me if these early Series A, Series B funds were directly related to submission of a patent, and then additional rounds of funding were related to some of the additional patents related to DNA sequencing that medicinal genomics have, has been able to acquire. So, do I think that a testing laboratory can provide a value add test to a cultivator or a breeder? Absolutely. Um, how so? Well, we can do cannabis and hemp genotyping. Um, we can look at disease resistance screening because some of the genes in the plant have nothing to do with, um, with, the, with, the, with the consumer interests, but rather just cultivation interests. And we, we want disease resistant plants and there are genes that help that. Um, it can be very useful for discovering new quantitative traits. And certainly, again, I think the primary one is for uh, getting intellectual property rights for, for, for breeding cultivars um, that have specific chemical profiles. The chemical profiles will be determined by analytical chemistry testing, but the plants will be recognizable from a molecular perspective based on DNA testing. And, uh, that's how many of the agricultural seed companies um, check to
to ensure that their seeds aren't being inappropriately distributed. All right, we have come to the end of the presentation. We've talked about the business climate, the regulatory climate, and provided an example of how next generation sequencing could be a value added test to a testing facility. Um, if you like this kind of presentation, I'd encourage you to consider purchasing a copy of Cannabis Laboratory Fundamentals. This is a textbook that I was invited to be the editor of. It's available on Amazon.com and Springer.com. gives a great introductory overview to cannabis laboratory testing. With that, uh, I would also encourage you to please connect with us. Um, my mobile number is 602-790-084. You can email me at e4bioscience.com and of course check out our LinkedIn website or our LinkedIn page and our website. With that, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining this presentation. Um, if you have any kinds of educational requests, please let me know. We're always looking to generate new content. Thanks. Have a great day. Trim.